Last Sunday, began looking at the historical account of Jonah and his call to preach. <clears throat> Even though some have disputed as to whether or not Jonah was an actual historical figure or not, he obviously was as set forth in God's word. He was to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is a city that is identified with wickedness and evil, cruelty, barbarity to others, brutality to others. They were the hated enemies of Israel. And Jonah is called to go and preach there. We see his call in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 2. When it says, Arise, <coughs> go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And we see that God detailed Jonah's mission so that Jonah could understand it, as anyone can, because God's word is understandable. Even though there's, t there's those who say, well, there's God talk and there's man talk. And man talk cannot understand God's talk. Well, God can make his message understandable. He sent Jonah to fulfill that message because he places that responsibility in man's hands. There was an urgency that was associated with it. You need to go and do this. Arise. Don't tarry. Don't wait. Don't delay. An urgency. And he was to cry against Nineveh's wickedness because their wickedness had come up before God. Jonah's response, though, as we all know, he decides to flee and go the other way to, and flees to Tarshish. He attempted to run away from God and the obligation that God had placed upon him. But yet we know the impossibility of such. So Jonah, though, finds a ship. He pays the fare to head toward Tarsus instead of to Nineveh. So God sends a storm, and there's a reminder that we find from what Moses says uh, but if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and behold, or and be sure your sins will find you out, in Numbers 32 and verse 23. Jonah's sins found him out. And so God prepares a great fish for Jonah. And in that great fish, and as he will remain in the belly of that fish, for three days and three nights, God was correcting him, but he was also transporting him to a shore so that he could safely carry out his mission. While he was in that great fish, we see his repentance. And his being three, day, <coughs> three days and three nights in that great fish's belly represented or symbolized Jesus being in the grave for three days and three nights. Jonah prays to God during that time, and sadly it does take affliction for many to call upon God, to pray to him. Many times when we are rich and doing well, we forget about God. But Jonah's heart was also thankful to God for sparing his life. For his sin, he could have been put to death. But God had spared his life. And also he realized that salvation is from Yahweh. Jonah 2 and verse 9, he says, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is is of the Lord. And so we start seeing his genuine repentance. Not a sorrow of the world, but a true godly 
repentance, a godly sorrow that worketh repentance unto salvation, 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. And God hears his cry. So God then gives Jonah a second call, starting in chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 2. And the word of the Lord came again unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. We see that God had forgiven Jonah in this. Jonah had prayed, he had requested forgiveness, and so at this time now, God is giving him this second call, but we also see God's forgiveness. In Hebrews 8, chapter and verse 12, the Hebrew writer says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. God did not, as man is prone to do, bring up Jonah's past mistake. Now, man probably would have started that second time, or that second call, by reminding Jonah, Jonah, don't do what you did before. Even though now then you're making it right, don't do that. Now then, go to, Gen go to Nineveh. That's what man so many times does. It might be year, something that happened years or even decades in the past. Something that someone has repented of, has received forgiveness of, but then all of a sudden something happens, and what do we do? I don't do this. I hope that he doesn't do that. That has already been forgiven. God doesn't do that. And neither should we. God forgave Jonah. He did not see the need to bring up Jonah's past mistake in fleeing to Tarsus. He also gives Jonah the same call as he did before. Jonah was to preach what God bid him. He was to deliver God's message. This wasn't a message that was coming from him, but it was coming from God. And we're, <coughs> we recall the word that Paul gives his son in the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, when he says, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The encouragement there, preach the word. That's what God is telling Jonah. You preach the word. Preach the message that I bid thee. And so in 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. That's, that's what we are to do. We are to be preaching God's message. He is not to go to Nineveh and give Nineveh the platitudes of men. How, you know, he could have gone and said, you know, it, um, it would be far more better for all these other nations and they could have good relations with you if you would just show them love and care for them and give them all. That's not the message he was to deliver. That would have been the platitudes of man. He could have said, you know, all of these nations are going to rise up and they're finally going to destroy you. But no, that wasn't God's message. He could have said, this person said that, this person said such and such. He wasn't going to give that. Far too many times today, within, even within the Lord's church, we have sermons that are devoid of Bible, and Bible preaching that is literally ridiculed by some. One person as a congregation was discussing who, to hold, who they wanted to hold a meeting for them. 
And so our name was suggested, and the comment about that individual was, no, we don't want him. He preaches too much Bible. Bible preaching ridiculed. God restricts us to his message and his message only. In Galatians 1, verses 6 through verse 9, Paul would say, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who hath called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we are preaching to you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which, which ye have received, let him be accursed. Don't change, don't alter it. Preach God's message, and if someone preaches a different message, then that person is to be eternally cut off from God. In Revelation 22, verses 18 and verse 19. Though speaking specifically about the book of Revelation, yet having application to the entirety of the Bible, John, in ending that book, says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Don't change, don't add to, don't take away from God's message. You deliver my message is what God says. But it's interesting when God gives Jonah this second call, his word did not change. He didn't say the first time, this is what you need to give. This is the message I want you to preach. And then the second time, say, well, let's change this or alter it up a little bit, and we won't say that. No, God's word does not change. And it doesn't change for us as well. The same thing that, for example, saved those on the day of Pentecost is exactly the same thing that will save us today without change, without alteration. The th same things that brought sin within the first century church bring sin when we engage in those things today. The same way in which we are to worship God and the first century church worshiped God is the same way we should be worshiping God today. God's word does not change. But then also, God's word is the only thing that will accomplish God's will. Isaiah would write in the long ago, Isaiah 55 and verse 11, So shall my word go, that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, <clears throat> but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. It will accomplish what God desires. It may not be what we desire. It may not be what we want. But it will accomplish God's desires. It will prosper from God's standpoint, even though we might not see that prospering, even though we might, you know, we might think it's unsuccessful. It just didn't work. Yet it works. We just might not know about it. And when we substitute something for God's word, it's not going to save anyone. It will only cause people to be lost. When Jonah arrives at Nineveh, it says that in Jonah 3 and verse 4, 
that Jonah began to enter into the sea a day's journey, and he cried and said, now then, here's his message. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I don't see how anyone could misunderstand that which Jonah had said. It was simple. It was plain. It was very understandable. It was very bold. Forty days, none of it will be overthrown. Well, you know, what does overthrown mean? Uh, what about... 30 days or 50 days or maybe it's a couple of months. It was very understandable. This is the time frame. This is what's going to happen. And Jonah's message, let's say it was not made to, feel, to cause people to feel good about themselves. Now we hear today, Preaching should make you feel good. Jonah's preaching did not make them feel good. In fact, it, it produced the opposite result. There was this man, this was many years ago, brought into a congregation. He was a church growth expert. That should have been a warning sign right there. But one of the things that he stated in regards to church growth is that you make sure that everyone leaves happy, peaceful. You never want to make anyone feel bad about themselves when they leave. When Jonah preached his message. They didn't feel good. It wasn't designed to make them feel good. They knew that they had to repent or perish. And this message was effective. Some and we hear this a great deal today, say that we should not preach hellfire and brimstone sermons today. We need to preach about the love of God and God's kindness and his graciousness and all of these positive things. Stay away from that hellfire and brimstone message. That might have worked, they would tell us, you know, a century ago, but it doesn't work now. Some have claimed that Jonah's message was actually wrong. Roy Osborne, he was preaching in the Lord's church, stated, and this is a long time ago, I believe he's dead now, but he said the sermon was effective temporarily. And he emphasized that temporarily. He went on to write, one might wonder if the story would have been different if Jonah had taken to, to them a tearful plea based upon the love of God instead of bitter denunciation based upon the wrath of God. You know, that's a disgrace. To say that Jonah's message was only effective temporarily. That he should have brought about a different approach. The thing is, Jonah preached the message that God wanted. That God bid him to preach. And now then we have someone 1900 years later saying he did it wrong. That he could have been more effective if he had done something else. No, it wouldn't have been effective at all. And Jesus recognized the effectiveness of it when he, uh, when he said in Matthew, the 12th chapter, and verse 41, the men of Nineveh, 
shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Jesus recognized Jonah's effectiveness in preaching. They repented at his preaching. And yet man will come along and say that Jonah did it all wrong. Jesus said he did it right. Then the Ninevites response. They repented. That's their response. But let's go a little bit deeper than that. Because first they believed God. Now I know that in that message that Jonah gives, yet 40 days Nineveh shall be destroyed. There's no preaching about your need to believe God. There's no proof that he said anything about God's existence. But for them to repent, they had to believe God. And they repented, Jesus says, at Jonah's preaching. So belief was incorporated into that message. You're going to be destroyed. Destroyed by whom? There was no physical power on earth militarily speaking, that was able to defeat them. Not at that time, at least. The only answer was it's going to come from God. And so they believed God. Second, they proclaimed a fast. About the only time we hear about fasting nowadays is when, you know, we get a little bit overweight and we want to lose some weight. That's never talked about in the Bible from the standpoint of fasting. Or fasting is never talked about in regards to losing weight in the Bible. It was a matter of tuning oneself in with God, if, you, if I can use that term. Fasting caused them and would enable a person to center their minds upon something. And so they proclaimed the fast. What? We want you to center your minds upon God and this message from Jonah. So what did they do? Not only proclaimed a fast, they put on sackcloth and sat in ashes. This is a sign of humility and deepest sorrow. To put on sackcloth was a very rough garment, did not feel comfortable, and so it would irritate the skin and thus irritate the individual. Sitting in ashes, a sign of their sorrow and their humility for what they've done. So they put on sackcloth, sat in ashes, and they cried unto God. But that wasn't sufficient. Because true repentance, while crying unto God was necessary, and all of these other aspects were necessary, that by itself was not sufficient. Why were they going to be destroyed? Well, God had stated because their wickedness has come up before me. So they had to turn from their wickedness. As we started this lesson, they had been known as a people who were wicked, evil. They were violent toward others. They were brutal in their actions toward other people. They would have to turn from that to try and be the type of people that God wanted them to be. In Jonah 3 and verse 10 thus, we read, And God saw their works, and 
and they turned from their evil ways. It says that God thus repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. They turned from their evil ways. That's what it took. They could have believed God. They could have had the greatest humility and sorrow for what they have done. They could have prayed to God, but unless they turned from their evil ways, they still would have been destroyed. It still would not have been repentance. Now then, we might say very clearly that the reason they repented, the reason that God saw their works that they turned from their evil way is because of what Jonah preached. Because it was so clear, so distinct, they understood it and they, it caused them to repent in all that that means. And the men of Nineveh, the people of Nineveh, they did not care how much Jonah cared about them. We often hear the phrase, and there's some truth to this, but it's not always the case. But we often hear that people do not care about how much you know until they know how much you care. How much did Jonah care about the Ninevites? Well, we're going to see that he didn't care anything at all about them except for them to be destroyed. That's why he ran the other way toward Tarsus. He wanted God to destroy them. He cared nothing about them. According to this idea, None of us say, well, you don't care anything about us. Just go on about your business. We don't want to hear that. All you want is for us to be destroyed. But they didn't care about Jonah's feelings. What they cared about was to be delivered from that destruction. People today <clears throat> who are lost in sins should be concerned with the truth of salvation and not be concerned with the feelings of the individual who brings that message to them. In our class this morning, uh, Paul mentioned uh, in Philippians, the first chapter, how that there were those individuals who were preaching the gospel, but they did it with improper motives. Should the people who heard them preach with improper motives say, you, well, your motives are wrong. I don't want to hear that. I'm not going to do what you say. No, they needed to obey the truth. The men of Nineveh were concerned with truth and escaping the destruction. We need to be the same way. Not who brings the message, but the truth that is involved. And we know, as Jesus stated, the truth shall make us free, John 8 and verse 32. It's not the feelings and the attitudes of the person who brings the truth, it's the truth itself. Now the truth is that God has set forth a way for man to be saved through our obedience to that gospel, through our faith in God, through our faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he is the sa our Savior, that he died for our sins. We repent of our sins even as the men of Nineveh repented. And then we make a confession of our faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then we're baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. That's the truth 
of, say, of say, salvation. If you want to be saved, you're going to have to do those things. If you become a Christian but have not lived in the manner that God expects, then God has provided another way in which his children can come back into him and be restored through confessing our sins and through prayer and, yes, repentance. Then we can be restored to him and we enjoy then those blessings that he gives. If you need to come this morning for that salvation, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.